Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome, welcome back to MRC, to our YouTube page, and to our big fall conversation on the most important thing we could possibly be talking about. And while it's the most important thing, I would also add, it's the most ignored thing when it comes to our lives today. See, what we're doing this fall is starting a big conversation focusing on the soul. This is a big deal because we live in a world today full of people who are really struggling right now. People who are struggling emotionally and mentally and with their relationship with God and with other people. And we're seeing people just struggle so much in their inner worlds. Our inner worlds seem to be broken. There's just so much turmoil in our lives today as a people. And what's interesting is we're seeing more and more people fall into depression, fall into anxiety. We're seeing mental health cases rising by the day. We're seeing people struggle to just work through the realities of life, the challenges we face, the the problems and pressures of life, adversity that comes at us each day, just struggling to work through those things. We're seeing people struggling more and more to just walk in relationships with other people. And we know that's part of God's design, that we would do life with people while watching more and more people struggle to do so. People are hurting right now. In all of our struggles, though, what's really interesting to me is we seem to be aware of it. We, we are seeing a growing awareness of mental health, of mental health issues and, and the concept of mental health care and self-care are becoming a bigger and bigger deal. So it's like we know and can acknowledge there's a problem. I mean, we're using a lot of terms today that didn't even exist 10 to 15, 20 years ago, did they? I mean, how many times have you walked through life and heard of a mental health day back in the 80s? That wasn't happening. You didn't hear of such a thing back then. We know about it now. We have new terms for emotional and social and mental issues coming out by the day. New diagnosis, new things happening, more struggles coming. And and we're seeing this as a growing problem in our world today, which which really shows us something that's very interesting. While we seem to have this heightened awareness of mental health issues, of emotional health issues, of our inner worlds being really in a a, a tough place as a people, while we see and clearly can acknowledge that we have a problem as a people that we need to take care of while we're adding more and more ways to take care of ourselves and our inner worlds and our mental health, the problem's only getting worse. We're living right in the middle of a mental health crisis that's growing by the day. So we're aware there is an issue. We as a people are more aware than ever before of how important our inner worlds are and that we need to care for them, but nothing we do seems to be fixing the problem. In fact, it just continues to grow. So that leads to an important question, doesn't it? And one we should be asking, are we missing something? And the answer to that question is, we are missing something. And here's what we're missing. We are profoundly spiritual beings. So what if our problems go deeper than just something that needs a practical fix or remedy and that needs to be dealt with on a profoundly spiritual level. See, I don't think there's any irony in the fact that we are struggling more and more as a people internally as we distance ourselves from God more and more each day as a culture, as a society, as people in this world. There's no coincidence here that we're struggling more and more inside than ever before in a time when we're stepping further and further and further away from God. This is an intentional choice we're making, and I see no irony in the fact that as we distance ourselves from God, we are struggling more internally than ever before. See, we must care for our souls. Your soul is the source of your life, and if it's ignored, it will become the source of your pain. So this is an incredibly important conversation, talking about this profoundly important and often ignored area of our lives, and it's going to give us an opportunity 
to talk about things that are way too popular in our world today. And we want you to see that so many of these painful realities and struggles that we face are going to come down to our soul and how it's being cared for or not. So we're going to spend the first half of this series really talking about different subjects and things that so many of us struggle with in our lives and we're, that we may have never realized are actually profoundly spiritual issues as our soul is processing things in our lives. And we're going to talk about how to overcome those things on a very spiritual level. It's going to give us a chance to talk about a lot of these mental health concepts. And, 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 and now, as we get started, I do want to say this, and I want you to hear me. That's not us undermining true mental health issues or the concepts of medicine and doctors and counselors. That's not what we're doing here, so don't hear that. But this becomes a very important conversation that must be had for us humans who are spiritual beings with a soul. So we're going to start this today, looking at these things that we're challenged with. We're going to talk about a major challenge to overcome in our lives, one that I think all of us struggle with on some level, and that's discouragement. And what discouragement is, is how our soul processes the circumstances that we find ourselves in in life, the adversity, the challenges, the stress, the pressures, the trials of our lives. Next week, Ken will be back talking to us about a major challenge that so many people are facing in this world, and that's depression. And depression is how our soul is processing regret. We'll be talking about anxiety. Anxiety is something we hear about all the time. People are struggling with anxiety. Well, anxiety is how our soul is processing fear. We're going to have an opportunity to talk about your value and your self-worth, which is how your soul is processing God's love for you on a very personal level. We'll have a chance to talk about holiness and the challenges of, of, of pursuing holiness in our lives and the temptations of sin. And we're going to be looking at how our soul is processing the tension between our desires, our appetites, and living our lives for God. Then in the second half of this series, it's going to be all about restoring our soul and looking at this idea that we restore our soul through worship. And we'll get to see that worship is so much more than just singing a couple songs on a Sunday morning. We're going to be jumping into this. This is such an exciting series that we're in as we talk about caring for and restoring our souls. But you know, I want you to know that this series is important and it's also very personal to me. And I know to you, I look super calm and cool and collected and confident and wonderful. I mean, Ken can tell you, I'm just so peaceful and centered all the time in my life. And you see that and I'm smiling and everything's good. But I want you to know that as wonderful as I may appear to you, I'm being very sarcastic there. I wrestle with these things too. And for me personally, it's depression and discouragement and loneliness that have always really been a struggle in my life behind the scenes. It's something I've always dealt with at some level. And in fact, the last couple of years, you know, I'm really thankful to have come out of this, but I was really struggling with depression and discouragement in my life. You know, life's hard enough, right? And it's so painful at times. And there were points there in the last few years that I was really struggling to just get out of bed and start my day. Now, you wouldn't have known it because I'm going to be nice and I'm, I'm going to smile and I'm going to be kind to you, but I was really struggling there for a while. It was a heavy time in my life and it made it hard for me to be around people and at times even function through my day. You know, you might have picked up on something like, man, Sam's a little withdrawn. He's not that good social pastor out there running around and checking on everybody and making sure everybody's good. But I was really struggling and hurting inside. It was more than just me not wanting to be friendly. I was hurting. Uh, probably a better word would have been devastated, to be honest with you. I was devastated because there were so many things going on in my life that I just didn't see coming. I felt stuck in so many ways, so hurt in so many ways, so confused in so many ways as I did my best to stand and do what God asked me to do, which I was so inspired to be part of, to live out God's word, to share that with others, and just devastated by how people 
would respond to that, devastated by the spiritual condition of people around me, devastated by people I cared about who would respond poorly, turn and leave me and walk away in life and add my life, my four children and the things they walk through in their lives. They're walking through different seasons of life. Some of them are really painful seasons of their lives. Some of them are, are frankly, terrifying seasons of their own lives. And it's all piling up. And hey, let's throw a global pandemic on top of all those things that we're dealing with. And all the people worried about what decision I might make next. Well, none of us knew what decision to make next. Well, nobody knew what the next day might bring. And I will just say, I was really struggling. Now, I can look back today, and I'm very thankful that God has pulled me through all that stuff, that really dark and heavy time in my life. And I know, I know, I'm better for all of those years of wrestling and battling through it all. But man, it makes subjects like this really personal to me. And I'm so thankful that we're jumping into it. It's important for us to talk about this stuff, even if it makes us a little uncomfortable, because we all have our struggles. Now, if you notice, I said I'm thankful that God has pulled me through those dark and heavy times in my life. And uh, because I got to tell you something, I was getting nowhere in my own strength and in my own efforts to fix it. I just couldn't fix it. I wanted to. I didn't want to be miserable. I didn't want to be hurting the way I was. But I was struggling in my own efforts. Now, I want to make sure I say this. That doesn't mean I wasn't making practical choices to do my best to pull out of things. I was working very hard on my heart condition and my mental health. I was focusing on the things I needed to focus on, trying to make the right choices to rest and and engage in healthy decisions. I was feeding my heart and soul with God's word. I was even meeting with a counselor through that time, and I did all the practical things that I needed to do to take steps out of all that. But in the end, I needed God to do what only God can do in my life. You know, Jesus says something that Ken was really pointing to last week as he introduced this soul series to us. It's found in Matthew 16. It's talking about self-help. He says, self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to finding yourself, your true self. What kind of deal is it to get everything you want but lose yourself? What could you ever trade your soul for? See, this is an important thing for you and I to grasp and understand about our inner worlds. And We are profoundly spiritual beings. We have a soul and our soul must be cared for. We live in a world that is built and designed to keep us unaware and distracted from ever understanding the truth that I just stated. We live in a world designed to pull us away from God, to not even recognize the importance of our spiritual health, our spiritual lives, our relationship with God, our souls. And I'll just say it, the world's doing a tremendous job of that. So we need to understand how profoundly spiritual we are and that in the end, we must care for our souls. You know, it can be the source of our lives. But if it's ignored, our souls can be the source of our pain. We're living in difficult times with people walking in intense internal pain and brokenness at a level that this world has never seen before at a time when we are distancing ourselves from God more than ever before. And our prayer is that as we walk through this series, you will begin to see the direct correlation between pulling away from God and the issues and pain we're facing and trying to work through as a people in our world and culture today. We are spiritual beings who talk of the importance of self-care in our inner worlds while ignoring the soul. The results of this are devastating, and it is so hard to watch people walk through when you know that God could free us from this so quickly and so easily if we would turn and face the reality of our spiritual self and our spiritual health. So last week, Ken was introducing this concept of the soul to us. And you might remember that question he was coming back to and asked us a good bit. It was a little intense and it should have grabbed your attention, made you think a little bit. He asked you if you were willing to change or die. And he was showing us studies of how many people, true, like 90% of people, when, when facing that reality in their lives, just aren't going to change, which is a fascinating thought. 
And hopefully he had your attention here and he was talking to us about what the soul is. And it's a good thing to explain as we start a series on it because it can seem kind of fuzzy, right? Like we can look at it as this spiritual thing that's just out there. And I really liked what he had to say on that. He said that when God created you in his image, God placed a soul inside of you. Then God breathed life into your soul, which brought you to life. That's an incredible thought. Your soul is the place that contains all of you. It contains your unique God imprint. It's filled with your hopes and dreams and and desires that are unique to you as a person. So you could say that your soul is what makes you who you are. Your soul is your eternal life center of you. Now that gives us something to talk about, doesn't it? The eternal life center of our lives is our soul. I think we need to say this. As people, we all that interested in eternal things? We focus on eternal things? Is that what people tend to focus on? Are we all that worried about or focused on eternity someday and spiritual things? Well, the answer is no, right? What we tend to focus on and worry about is today, what we see and feel right now. We're not worried about eternity or spiritual things. We, fo- we, we worry about and focus on the things we feel right now, the physical things, the emotional things, the things right in front of us that we can physically see, not the things for a million bazillion years from now when we're all singing for all of eternity to come. We don't seem to worry about such things as we feel the intensity and the emotions, and the stressors, and all that comes with right now. We tend to be a bit more reactive as a people to today rather than proactive to thinking about eternal things, and I think that's a big part of the issue. We chase things that we see on the surface of our lives, and while we do that, we just feel so empty because we're ignoring what truly matters. We chase things we physically see while ignoring the spiritual. We chase things like success, material possessions, wealth, and all that stuff that people can see and look at and be impressed by. And we don't care for our souls. And we need to understand that our soul is the most important part of who we are. So in a world distancing itself from God and spiritual health, a world literally intentionally designed to destroy our souls, we walk through it, distancing ourselves from God with everybody else in the crowds of people that are, and we wonder why we're struggling more than we ever have before. And we have to understand that our soul is the most important thing, and it will be revived as we learn to live our lives with God. So today we really start this journey, a journey of into the soul like, and overcoming different things that our soul is processing and, and the challenges that we face each day. And we're starting with discouragement. We're starting with this look at how our soul processes trials, challenges, adversity, and the difficult circumstances we find in our lives. This is what discouragement really is. You may not be able to define it like we did here in one sentence, but I think it's important for us to see because we all feel it, right? Now, when you feel it and think about that sentence, how our soul processes the difficult, challenging, and often painful circumstances of our lives, we can kind of say, yep, yep, been there, felt that, right? Well, that's discouragement, and it's so tough. And I want you to see that discouragement is never really the first step into a tough situation, but it's really the aftermath of things that you're working through and the difficult or overwhelming circumstances you find yourself in because of something that happened, some choices you made, some things that did or did not maybe happen in your own life. A couple examples. You might have this dream out in front of you, this goal for your life, and you're shooting for it, and you're going for it, and you fall short of accomplishing it for whatever reason. And now in that spot where you realize you're never going to get there, you feel disappointment, you feel hurt, You have no idea what to do next. You may have believed in what you were doing so much and it didn't happen. And discouragement comes and overwhelms us in that painful place. Another example would be maybe you're just crushing it in life. You're you're succeeding. You have one win after another. You're succeeding. You're climbing the ladder. And all of a sudden you find yourself in the aftermath of all that success with more responsibility and more to do than ever before. 
And in that circumstance, you're now being crushed and overwhelmed with exhaustion and stress in this pressure-filled place, and discouragement can come and overwhelm you there. You know what's wild is we get a lot of great examples of people struggling with discouragement in Scripture. I had a lot of fun with that. I mean, there's probably a hundred or more that I could have gone to and looked at the different discouragement that people face in Scripture. We're going to look at a couple examples of that today, but what was interesting to me is that in most cases, there's really a pattern in Scripture to those dealing with discouragement. And the pattern really comes down to their focus and what they're focused on. These people who are dealing with discouragement, stuck in this painful place in their life, all seem to have a focus on the wrong things. Their focus shifts from God to their circumstances and the things that are around them. There's a pattern here. And I want you to see it. Just for fun, we're going to look at two examples of this. We're going to start in the Old Testament. We'll go to the New Testament. And the first one we're going to look at is from the book of Psalms. And it's an Asaph psalm. And it's one that I actually was in a pretty difficult spot with. And my father actually shared this one with me and told me to read it And when I was in that spot of discouragement. And tell me if you can't see this pattern of, this, uh, of focus on our circumstances start to come out here. So this is Psalm 73, where we find this guy Asaph in a very difficult spot. Psalm 73, verses 1 through 5. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. They're not plagued by human ills. Okay, so what's happening here with Asaph? Asaph's talking about a time when he was really struggling. His feet had almost slipped. He's in a tough spot. And I want you to see this. He's looking around at everybody else around him. He's seeing their circumstances and comparing them to his own. He's struggling because he was living this good godly life, making good godly choices, and everybody around him is having a little more fun. Everybody around him seems to be getting out ahead of him. He's focused on all the wrong things here. Asaph is incredibly discouraged, and he continues even wondering why he's living this good godly life while everybody else's circumstances seem to be better than his. Psalm 73, 12 through 14, Asaph continues, This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree, they increase in wealth. Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. In vain I have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been plagued. I have been punished every morning. He's in a tough spot here. Focused on everybody else around him and not on God. Now don't worry. He finds his way through this discouraging time. And by the end of the psalm, He's refocusing on God, recentering on him, and not focusing on his or other people's circumstances around him. I'll just read a couple verses here, 21 to 23. I'll add verse 28 here just so you can see how this thing ends. Asaph says, Then I realized that my heart was bitter and I was torn up inside. I was so foolish and ignorant. I must have seemed like a senseless animal to you. Yet I still belong to you. You hold my right hand. Verse 28. But as for me... How good it is to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my shelter. I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do. I want you to see this. Looking around on everything around him, the outside world, the circumstances around him, is always going to lead to discouragement. Because the focus is all wrong. Asaph finds himself in this spot because his eyes have shifted off of God and onto all the people around him. Let's do one more just for fun. This is a great story. This actually came out in an impromptu talk last week with MRG, and I wanted to come back to it because it's such a good example of what we're talking about here. So we're going to go to, to John. You're going to see something here, and I'll just kind of frame it for you first. Jesus is walking up to this pool, what they call the Pool of Bethesda. Now, the Pool of Bethesda is a, a pool where they believe there were healing powers there. So a lot of crippled and sick people. They'd come there. If they could get into the water while it was all stirred up, they believed they could be healed. Now Jesus is about to walk up to a man who's been laying beside this pool of Bethesda, unable to get into the water for 38 years. 38 years. Imagine how discouraged you would be if you truly believed your healing was four feet away from you for 38 years and you just couldn't get in the water. And from this moment, we get one of the best questions Jesus could ever ask. 
And an even more important response, I think, for us to look at here today. So this is found in John 5. I'll pick it up in verse 3. It says here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, one who was an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Absolutely love that question. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And once, at once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. Now, I want you to think about this. This poor guy is dealing with an unfathomable amount of discouragement, hopefully at a level of which you and I will never have to walk through. Imagine how frustrating and difficult and discouraging it is to not be able to move those four feet for 38 years. It's in that moment that Jesus walks up to him and asks an unbelievable question, right? With what should have a very clear answer. He says, do you want to get well? And what's the man's reply? His reply should be, yes, that's the reply. That's what it should be. But what does he do? He starts talking about his circumstance. I'm here. I want to get in the water. I can't get in the water. No one will help me. I got all this stuff going on. The answer is yes. But he doesn't give that answer, does he? He's focused on everything around him, not looking at the fact and focused on a man who can heal him, God in skin, right in front of him on that day. It's that pattern again. Asaph was focused on things around him and not on God. Here's this crippled man who just sees his circumstances. Discouragement makes us magnify. It magnifies your circumstances. It's what we focus on rather than focusing on God. I want you to see this. Discouragement is so real and it is so painful and it often is laying so heavy on us because we lose our focus. We, we see and feel our circumstances. The more discouraged we are, the bigger those things are around us. And we struggle to see a way through because our focus is all wrong. You see, when we're discouraged, we can slide into a couple of traps that we've got to really be careful in. The first thing that ends up happening when we're discouraged, when we're in that state, that frustration, that just emptiness of discouragement is we're going to have this temptation to isolate. We're going to want to just check out on things. And then when we're all alone, we're in a worse spot. And then our temptation is to fix it ourselves. And it just adds to this vicious cycle of things that we're never going to get done in our own strength. The, the way through is God, not us. It's not our own strength. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have things to do and choices to make. It's, it, it, but it's important that we aren't giving in to our emotions and the things that discouragement tells us to do. And that leads us into our big story of the day. And this one is a lot of fun. You know, growing up as a, as a kid, I think Elijah has always been my favorite character in Scripture. Talks a lot of trash, wins some incredible victories, deals with a lot of stuff. And we're going to talk about Elijah's life here today. And while most people are going to know the story we're jumping into a little bit, I believe that God, as he's restoring Elijah's soul here, is giving us a blueprint, really, on what we need to do to overcome discouragement in our lives. So, Let's look at this. I love this story. I'm sure I've preached on it before. I'm sure I'll preach on it again because it's so much fun. But as our story starts, and we're back in 1 Kings, it's going to start with Elijah having won this incredible victory for God. Now, when I say an incredible victory, I mean he has literally just defeated the prophets of Baal in an all-out duel. Him versus all them. He does it in front of the king. He does it in front of the entire nation of Israel. The, the, it's a duel to the death. The prophets of Baal put to death. An incredible victory for, for God. The, the, the people are now worshiping God. God. They're in awe of him. And not only was it an incredible victory, done so in front of the entire nation of, of, of Israel. This man has prayed to God that God would send fire from the sky to light an altar on fire and burn up a sacrifice, and the Lord sent fire from the sky to do so. I mean, you talk about triumph and faith and success. Elijah has literally just prayed down fire from the sky. This is like superhero level stuff. This is unfathomable. This is beyond incredible. He has confidently stood up for God and God has worked through him in, in, in the most unfathomable way maybe ever recorded 
in our scriptures. This is unbelievable. So you would think in this ultimate victory, in this place that he's at, his confidence level would be through the roof, right? If you're calling down fire from the sky, I think I wouldn't want anybody cutting me off in traffic on the way home if I could do stuff. I mean, we'd have some confidence there, right? Well, word gets back to Jezebel that her, um, her prophets of Baal have all been put to death by Elijah and that her gods have been discredited and she's furious and she threatens to kill him. And when Elijah... This guy who could call fire down from the sky, this, this victorious prophet of God, hears the news that Jezebel is threatening his life. What does this triumphant prophet of God do? He runs for his life and wants to die. Check this out. This is 1 Kings 19, 3 through 5. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the desert, he came to a broom tree sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. You know, maybe this is why I like Elijah so much, because I get it. He's in this difficult, painful place in his life, and he he just gets to the spot where he just wants to be alone, leaves his servant, goes another day further, crawls in under a tree, asks God to kill him, and just goes to sleep. This guy is empty. This guy is so down. I mean, and it's wild, right? He's just won this incredible victory. He was so courageous. He gets this one threat from Jezebel after calling fire down from the sky. And instead of standing tall, he runs for his life. And now he's laying under a tree all alone, just hoping and praying that God will kill him. So I want you to see a couple things here. And we'll come back to this throughout the talk, but we have to remember, and Scripture reminds us of this in in James, right? That Elijah, even though he did great things, God moved through him in great ways, is a person just like you and I. Now, he just had this incredible victory in his life, but I want you to think about what that must have been like. To stand up for God against an entire nation, against the king that hates you, against uh, the prophets of Baal, to do it very publicly, to have God move through you in that way. Think of the stress and the, the pressure and how overwhelmed you would feel, the energy you've put into that and how exhausted you would be in that moment. I think it's really interesting that after this incredible high, now in this tired, exhausted, empty place, after pouring everything he had into something, that's when the bad news comes. That's when the negative comment, hit, comment hits. And in that stressful, overwhelmed feeling, feeling, he makes the choice to run away. He isolates himself from people. He's completely empty. He's completely alone. And now he just wants to die. Like, that's a turnaround, right? But I want you to think about your own life for a moment. When you're struggling, when you're tired, you could be tempted to do this, right? What Elijah did. Now, we're not running off into the wilderness to sit under a a broom tree and sleep, but, boy, a dark basement and Netflix and chill sounds good, right? Isolating in some way, finding something to do where you don't have to bug anybody or deal with anybody, We're seeing a lot of this these days. You know, my son, not in the notes, but was telling me more and more kids at school don't want to deal with people anymore. And they're going online for school. Not saying you can't go online for school and do well, but like we do this, don't we? We pull away. We are tempted to isolate just like Elijah did here. And that's when discouragement really has an opportunity to push in. So many of us find ourselves in this type of place in our lives exhausted and empty, just wanting to check out on life and be alone. And it's in this moment that we're going to see God start to minister to Elijah, to restore Elijah. And I believe we can learn a lot about soul care and overcoming discouragement in our lives today from what happens. And what's really neat is the first thing that God does doesn't seem real spiritual. It's actually very practical. It's like small, but it's big. And I want you to see this. I think this is beautiful. 1 Kings 19, 5 through 9. All at once, remember he's sleeping under a broom tree. That's where we left him. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was a cake of bread over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. 
The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for your, the, journey, the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Then he went into a cave and spent the night. So God restore, begins to restore Elijah, and he does it in two very loving, practical things here. Twice, an angel tells him to do what? Get up and eat. Now, this might not sound like a big deal. This might not sound very spiritual to you, but this is important. Not to lose sight of the little practical choices and things that we can do that have a profound impact on our health and our lives. This gives Elijah a couple things to just accomplish to move forward in. Get up. Check. I can do that. Eat. Check. Oh, look at that. I've done two things here. Get up. Take care of yourself. So often when we're in these empty places in our lives, when we're exhausted and we're stressed and we're weighed down by our issues, we ignore or miss doing these little things that can really help us along the way. Get up and eat. We rest. We care for ourselves. We nourish ourselves. These are important things that we need to do. And once Elijah's done that, now it's time for him to go and meet God. And this is an awesome moment, and it's going to take us back to that pattern of focus that we've seen in Asaph, that we saw in the cripple laying by the pool of Bethesda. And I want you to see this because we're going to have God ask Elijah a great question, and Elijah struggled to answer it twice, right? So remember where we left him. He was sleeping in a cave and all of a sudden this happens. This is 1 Kings 19, 9 through 14. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to the death with the sword. I'm the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go and out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to the death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. So I find this fascinating, right? God asks Elijah the same question twice, right? What are you doing here, Elijah? And just like our other two guys that we've looked at in our stories today, Elijah doesn't answer the question, but starts rattling off and talking about his circumstances. Both times he blows off the the, the question and just goes on a rant, right? I'm discouraged, I'm exhausted, I'm frustrated, I'm working super, super hard for you, God. I've done everything you've asked you. I'm completely done. I'm exhausted. People have rejected you. They can't stand me. I'm all alone. All the prophets are dead. The altars are torn down. Like, I'm all by myself here, God. No one's on my side. Or back to that pattern. The focus is on his circumstances, not on the fact that he's talking to God right now. That'd be a a start, right? Elijah says, I'm all alone, God. Look at my circumstances, God. But the thing that we lose sight of as discouragement fills our lives is that our focus shouldn't be on our circumstances. Our focus must be on God. Now, God so lovingly restores Elijah here. Now, he tells him to do something that I don't think Elijah wanted to hear. He tells him to go back where he came from. He just ran from that place. I don't know why he'd want to go back, but like he tells him he needs to go back because his work's not done. He also explains to him, Elijah, you're not alone. I've hidden some prophets in a cave. You're good. You also have a buddy that you're going to meet along the way named Elisha. He's going to be your friend. He's going to walk with you and talk with you and engage with you in ministry. But Elijah, your work's not done. You know, it's an incredible story of restoration. And it shouldn't be lost on us that through Elijah's pain and this incredible story and the intensity of all that, that we can't see what's going on here because we get a way to overcome discouragement in our lives here too. 
So how do we find our way through discouragement and despair? Well, the first thing I want you to do is remember that you're human. You are a person. James tells us that Elijah, the fire caller from the sky, was a man, a person, just like us. What that means when we remember we're human is that there are incredible highs and devastating lows in our lives. And we can't ignore the energy and effort that it takes that we need to put into things. And even when we're really busy or stressed out or cluttered, we have to remember to take care of ourselves, to rest, hydrate, clean up. Remember, get up and eat. To recover is so important. We're people. We aren't robots. We can't just keep pushing through. The second thing that I think we have to do is avoid the temptation to isolate. Do not isolate. When discouragement hits, it's going to scream at you to check out. When we're tired and we're running thin and stressed out and struggling, the last thing we're going to want to do is be around other people. But remember, we're not created to do life alone. And isolating is what your enemy would want because it makes you vulnerable to him. And the next thing he's going to do when you're alone is tell you to clean it up and get it done in your own strength. And we can't. We need God in it. We must not isolate. The next thing is is an important step, and it's to do something. This is such a practical thing. Just like we saw with Elijah. Man, he's in a terrible spot. Get up and eat. Do something. We find our way through discouragement. It might just start with a small step or two. Getting something done in your day. Go out, accomplish something. Elijah was told by the angel twice, get up and eat. Just start by accomplishing something small. That's an important important thing. Get some positive steps rolling in your life. Get some momentum going in the right direction. Care for yourself even if you don't feel like it. Take little steps towards positive things because those little steps are actually big steps out of discouragement. Take care of yourself. Might need a Snickers once in a while, right? Put some calories back in your body. Do something as small as getting up and eating. Sometimes just doing something is a really, really big deal. And the last thing I would say, and I think this is the the biggest part of understanding discouragement is focus on your focus. Discouragement is how your soul processes the, dis- the, the circumstances that you're finding yourself in. And it's very easy when we're walking through difficulty, when we're walking through challenges, to focus on all the wrong things. We must be careful that our focus never leaves God and drifts into our circumstances. It's a pattern we see all through Scripture. We looked at three examples of that today. When our focus leaves God and drifts to the challenges, adversity, and pain of our lives, which we will face, we will succumb and can succumb to discouragement in our lives. When we focus on God and we're pouring into a relationship with Him, and what we, we can stay focused on what He's doing in our lives, even when we're walking through those realities of our lives. We find our way through Because we know, regardless of our circumstances, that we're not alone. That God loves us, protects us, provides for us, and will never leave us. Listen, we love you so much. And we want you to understand something about these challenges that we all face in our inner worlds. We are spiritual beings with a soul. And our soul can be the source of our lives. And if we ignore it, our soul can be the source of our pain. So I just have a few very simple questions for you as we close. And I want you thinking about this today. Do you take care of your soul? I'd like you to think about your life right now. What things do you do that are good, positive, and healthy for your soul and your spiritual life? Now, I want to ask you something else. What things do you do that aren't helping your soul or your spiritual life? You need to think about this. This is so important. What choices do you make that help you? And what choices are you making that are not helping your soul? We need to think about this. Your choices matter. This is so important because in the end, things are going to keep hitting your life. Life will keep happening. It doesn't necessarily like, get easier. Life won't let up because God's in it. 
You just get to walk through it with God, which makes it completely different. You will still deal with stuff. Life will keep hitting. But without caring for our soul, though, when our soul's broken and busted up, we're making a difficult life much more difficult. Life will keep happening. We need to stay focused on our relationship with God and to feed our soul well, or life will only get harder and more painful. Think this through today. We all face discouragement. And when it hits, we can be tempted to check out. And, and in that painful reality, we can lose sight of the truth. That God does love us. That God absolutely does have us. And that God will never leave us or forsake us. We don't check out as discouragement hits our life. We lean into our Heavenly Father and we find restoration for our souls in Him. We love you so much and we'll see you again next week.